it's funny, Ed's saying, what's my rego number? Well, I knew it was one that did something or other. <laughs> so I'm driving home and I'm thinking, what a great day out. Where else would you have a guy from South Korea making Turkish guzzle in Australia? And I thought I'd give Michelle a quick call. She's here with me at the moment. I said, you fancy guzzle when I get back? What do we need? So I had to pop in get some uh, spinach, I got some feta cheese. Gozulami? What are you making? Gozulami. Rosemary? Gozulami. What is that? It's a Turkish bread includes spinach and feta. Gozulami? Gozulami. Ah, so it has a cheese inside. Yeah, inside the feta or some kind of lamb or chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Spinach feather, yeah, cheddar, cheddar, yeah, yeah. feather, like uh, cheddar feather, feather, yeah, uh, spinach, little bit of salt and pepper, just salt, just salt, ah, pepper, and, uh, make it nice, yeah, and a cook, that's it, <laughs> and uh, with lemon, <laughs> with lemon, yeah, yeah. yeah. My name is Yong Unam. Yong? Yong Unam. Unam. Yeah. English name is Nick. Nick? Yeah, Nicholas Nick. Where are you from, Nick? Um, from the Korea. Korean, yeah? Yeah, not North Korea, South Korea. Nah. Yeah. You know that North Korea is Kim Jong Un, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 No Kim Jong Un. So, how long have you been here? Uh, just six months. Just six months? Yeah. And you're already making Gozlami? Yeah, right? I'm professional Gozlami. <laughs> <laughs> Behind me is a statue of one of the greatest West Australians that ever lived. His name was C.Y. O'Connor. He's an Irish engineer that came out to West Australia in the 1800s. This guy was a genius. He designed the Fremantle port, which we're at now. He also engineered and designed the water pipeline, which took water from the Perth Hills and pumped it to the gold fields because the gold fields that's where all the wealth was coming out of West Australia, but there was no water up there. He built the pipeline. But it cost a lot of money, this pipeline, and, he, and the press absolutely murdered him. They said it was a complete and utter waste of money. Now, when they finished the pipeline and turned the, the, the pumps on, after a couple of weeks, the water wasn't flowing in Kalgoorlie, and the media went berserk. They said it was a white elephant, did not work. And this bloke behind me, C.Y. O'Connor, what he did was, through public shame, he hopped on a horse, went to the beach nearby here, uh, got into about a metre of water, and then took a pistol to his head and shot his brains out. But the funny thing is, the water eventually came through at the other end. So, yeah, he committed suicide for nothing. A sage of information. So this is a Fremantle prison. They call this a Fremantle prison, is it? Or? That's another one again, it's called the Roundhouse. The Roundhouse, is it? Yeah. On the 2nd of July 1832, you were convicted of larceny of goods. It doesn't specify what. 14 days imprisonment, and you're to be whipped in front of the jail in Fremantle on the day you go in. Guilty as charged. And the day you come out. This. <laughs> Just want to tell you, that sentence was passed on an 11-year-old boy. <gasps> wow! So that's interesting. <laughs> that sentence passed down on an 11 year old boy. <laughs> Head's been naughty. <laughs> New Year's Day, 1834. You were convicted of assaulting a constable in the execution of your duty at Fremantle. 14 days imprisonment with hard labour. However, probably because it was New Year's Day and the judge may have been feeling quite kindly, he recommended you to mercy.
going near the ocean, well, it's just, it's just you just got to have fish and chips. That's right. You can't come to a place like this and not have fish and chips, can you? Eagle Eye Ed managed to find a spot. He's gone in to order his fish and chips. Let's go see what it's like. There you go, Ed. Oh, it's looking good. You good, mate? We were just talking about whether or not I should vlog on the channel, and you say it's, it's all right, yeah? Well, vlogging on your channel gives your subscribers a bit of an insight into your personality, you know, uh, what you're interested in, your hobbies, uh, and I, th I think it's important, you know, you build a bit of more of a rapport. So somehow I sort of try and build beer drinking into my videos, but I'm on the on the Lipton iced teas today. <laughs> Another girly drink, Steve. <laughs> One of the problems you have with this YouTube malarkey is you film things and forget to turn the camera on. And then you've got to do the whole thing again. Yeah, and sometimes you, your tongue gets all twisted in the middle of saying something, and then you, you've got to backtrack a bit, and then... Now this guy was a genius. He designed the Fremantle... This guy was a genius. Redo it and then edit it out later, so... Uh, to make yourself that's look That's what good. I do, yeah. To make yourself look good, right? Yeah, that's right, to make yourself look good. How you doing, Ed? Oh, I meet my friend. Yeah, she's... Uh, She's quite interesting. She's beautiful eyes on her own. She has got beautiful eyes. G'day beer lovers. Behind me is the West Australian Museum of Shipwrecks. This museum behind me houses the relics from a ship called the Batavia. Now the Batavia got shipwrecked on the West Australian coast in 1628. There was a mutiny on board and the mutineers uh, were, were taking over the ship but then the captain ordered the ship to keep going west and unfortunately it crashed into the Abrolhos Islands which is north of Perth. There were 341 people on board the ship. Now the captain, his, no, his name was Captain Pelsart, he then got in a long boat and he rowed all the way to Indonesia to get help. It took him about a year to come back. Uh, now one of the mutineers, his name was Cornelius, okay, him and his cohorts started killing the other survivors. They started cannibalizing each other. They had to, they were desperate. They needed to survive. What happened next was that Pelsart came back, rounded up the mutineers and executed them, hung them all. But that was after he chopped off their arms and legs. Yeah, it's pretty bloody brutal. Okay, now in, behind me is one eighth of the hull of the Batavia. Now the timbers of the Batavia were found in the 1960s, okay? And then the timbers were uh, put into this solution to preserve them, and they've been, been able to rebuild from the original timbers one eighth of the hull of the Batavia. And it's, and it's in this museum behind me. And together with 24 cannons, yeah, this bloody boat, Batavia, bloody, it had 24 cannons, 341 people on board. Um, yeah, so that was in 1628. That was 200 years before the establishment of the Swan River Colony. Okay, follow me. Let's go into this museum and look at the, the ship called the Batavia. Pelsart came back with help. He rounded up all the mutineers and executed them. First of all, he chopped off their hands and their feet, and then he hung them. So that skeleton down there is one of the murdered shipwreck survivor, well, what do I say, survivor. They survived the shipwreck, but then they got murdered by, yeah, of course, yeah. by the mutineers. So I'm driving home and I'm thinking, what a great day out. Where else would you have a guy from South Korea making Turkish guzzle in Australia? And I thought I'd give Michelle a quick call. She's here with me at the moment. I said, you fancy guzzle when I get back? What do we need? So I had to pop in get some uh, spinach, I got some feta cheese, and we're not making it any different than the way Nick made it today in Perth. Now I'm running out of flour. I'm probably only gonna make one gosme, so I'm gonna put a cup of flour into a bowl. You've gotta season the flour, so I'm gonna put uh, probably about half a teaspoon of salt in with that. So I might have to adjust this a little bit, a little extra flour or a little extra water. I'm just gonna get a fork in there, start to pull this together. Now get my hands in, get a little dirty. And you can see that's looking just a little bit dry for what I'm wanting. Just gonna add a splash more water in. So I've got a dough now that isn't gonna be sticking to my hands and going all over the place. It's a reasonably dense dough. We'll just bring it out onto the counter and I'll give it a little knead, just a, a probably a five minute knead just to get the smoothness into the dough. 
I'm gonna keep this really simple. I don't want you, the viewers, to get too over complex with making this. I need to pop this dough aside and just let it bloom, let it flower for a little bit. And I am gonna drizzle a nice bit of olive oil over the top. So just want the spinach nicely diced up. I reckon start to finish, you could probably make this at home in about 15 minutes. Just allow a bit of time for the, the bread to, or the dough to develop. Right, let's check whether the dough, oh, it's almost ready. Whatever flour we've got left, I'm just gonna flour out my counter, spread it around a little bit. What I'm gonna do now is just start to shape this out. So a bit of flour on the bottom. I'm just spinning it with my hand. Now this is where I'm starting to wonder whether they might use just all purpose flour because you can feel the stretch of the gluten in this is really quite, quite strong. And, but if I'm just patient and I keep pushing it out, it's really worth investing in those, you know, several different rolling pins in your kitchen because not every rolling pin works well for every type of bread. It's getting a little dry on the back, so I just pull some flour back over. Get it as thin as possible. I want it almost paper thin if I can. You see how thin that is? Really, I'd like it, get the travel bangles out of the way, I'd like it um, even thinner than that if I can. See, that's almost floating now on the, on the air. It's thin enough. Now, that is looking great. Happy with that. Our friend Nick started with the cheese, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the cheese. So I've got a grated mozzarella. Nick did say cheddar, but I didn't have any cheddar in here. I've also got this wonderful um, feta cheese. I'm just gonna actually break this up and just crumble it on top of the mozzarella, so we're gonna get a lovely sharpness from the feta. Salt, I know the feta is salty, but I think this needs a little bit of salt in there as well. Nick didn't use pepper as far as I could see, but I'm gonna put a bit of black pepper in because I think I like it. Next, I've got my spinach. Right, time to make our little parcel. I'm gonna fold that over. The goslami doesn't have a lot of air inside this pocket. Now, he also just trimmed off the edge to tidy it up. Don't really need to do this, but I think I will. Just take that little bit of pastry away. And that's pretty much ready now to go onto our skillet. Now I just brought the skillet in off the barbecue and I'm just gonna drizzle a little bit of olive oil onto where I'm gonna put the bread. And then we're gonna take this and pop it down on that hot oil. I drizzle a little bit of oil over the top as well. Right, we're ready to flip this over. On to the other side. Oh, that's looking gorgeous. Nick said, uh, serve it with a bit of lemon. So I'm thinking I've got a little piece of lemon left in the fridge. I'm just gonna squeeze some lemon over and I think this will help cut through the oils in here. So you can see it's not hard to make even after a long day, 20 minutes. Such a big payoff. You're gonna absolutely love this if you make it at home. So here goes. Mm. Oh. Oh. Wow, that's delicious. That's so good. Michelle, let's, let's not share. Let's make another one. He rounded up the... Oh, I'm gonna start all this again, because I missed the fact that there was, there was a mutiny on board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you bugger. I, I, I haven't told the story properly. All right, there we go. I'm running out of battery. But, 